Now before we start part two, um, what I'd like you to do is just push, push the pause button for a minute and go and look for this particular video on YouTube. It's a very light-hearted way of looking at laces and how they work, but it will just, if you like, add to the principles and ideas that I've already shown you in part one. I'll see you in one minute 20 seconds after you've watched this video. Now we mentioned when we were talking about carbon dioxide how it is possible for some of these energetic um, particles, or some of these energetic molecules to come along and entice one of the oxygen atoms away or knock it off, however you like to imagine it. But basically there could be some free oxygen atoms floating around in here and that means that we no longer have carbon dioxide. And so we lose some of our efficiency. The hydrogen is put in there to act almost like a marriage broker. It talks to this oxygen nicely and says, look, I think you ought to give it another try. And so it helps the oxygen to bond back with the carbon monoxide to turn it back into carbon dioxide so that it can do its job again. Sadly, after you've given it quite a few tries, this oxygen may actually decide to stay away from the partnership. And that's not a good thing, as we will explain to you when we see a graph very shortly. So just bear that in mind that if that oxygen goes free and doesn't recombine to make carbon dioxide, we've, get, we've got less gas mix in our tube to produce the lacing action. The hydrogen has been put there as a catalyst to help reunite the carbon monoxide and the oxygen into carbon dioxide and prolong the life of the tube. Now in one of those scholarly research papers that I came across I discovered the holy grail that I'd been searching for. It was a beautifully simplistic diagram to show me how and why a sealed laser tube fails. And it basically was confirmation of all the things that I had been working towards um, in part one. I'm going to reproduce the essence of that diagram here, but obviously I can't reproduce the real diagram by reason of copyright. But if you're interested in tracking down the, uh, the source of that scholarly work, I'll happily pass the link on to you if you'd like to message me on the YouTube message board. Now there's no numbers on these pictures because you can make them fit whatever you want. So let's assume that the power line across the bottom is a thousand hours long and the power up the side could be 50, 60, 80, 100 watt, depending on what your laser is. But the picture is likely to be the same no matter what your power. And as we look up the stack of graphs here, we'll see that probably at around about the 65 to 70 percent life of your tube the carbon monoxide starts to grow at a fairly rapid rate. Oxygen and the hydrogen, when you look at their relationship, if you remember I said that hydrogen was a marriage broker, that oxygen stopped listening to the hydrogen fairly early on and gradually started to do its own thing. So the hydrogen became less effective, the free oxygen became greater. This is the thing that we call oxygen poisoning. Now at the same time as the hydrogen was doing its job less and less, so the carbon dioxide obviously started to peel off. And at the top there you can see nitrogen and helium are totally unaffected by what's going on. Now the metal that the electrodes are made from can have an effect on this lifespan as well, but it's a relatively small effect and the essence of the story is contained in these graphs here. I'm just about to put an unexpected insertion into my video here. I was having an offline correspondence with one of my fellow users just recently on a completely different subject all about the power supply and the ballast resistors and and how you actually control the current to uh, the laser machine. And as a response to that discussion he pointed me to a rather interesting website. Now I've got to share this with you because I was absolutely staggered at what I found here. It's an American company called Parallax Technology Inc. and they manufacture their own industrial laser tubes. Now they do manufacture laser tubes down at the 35 watts and the 60 watt range so that uh, you know you could fit one of these 
uh, industrial quality laces into your machine. Uh, they've got a guaranteed four year warranty um, and you know if you buy a 60 watt tube you will get 60 watts unlike me buying my 50 watt tube and getting 37 watts. Anyway here we are at this website and something that popped out rather interestingly although we've got over the side here power supplies when I look down here I find major cause of laser tube failures. Read this please. So let's go down and have a look and they say basically you know one of the major causes that they get is uh, if you don't use the flow switch and you turn the tube on you'll heat the tube up remember you haven't put the water on turn the water on crack the tube end of story so that's one of the things that they're mentioning here but somewhere down at the bottom here they mention this section here let me just read this to you the second important cause of tube failure is due to improper operation the desire to run the tube at a higher wattage than is recommended it is unwisely thought that if a PLX60, a 60 watt tube, can run at 75 watts, then one can get 15 watts for free. Why not operate at maximum available as opposed to maximum recommended power? And then they go on to say that without getting into the details of CO2 laser tube design and note this phrase and gas dissociation, it suffices to say that the extra 15 or 20 percent power is intentionally put in there to carry the laser tube through the lifetime that we require of it. In other words they supply a four-year warranty and because the tube will degrade they've built an extra 15 or 20 percent into the tube so that it still maintains after four years its power ability. If it was meant to run at 75 watts it may have had a different length or different mirrors. Operating the tubes in this mode is what is referred to as abuse or misuse and will void the power guarantee. That's fascinating. So here we have the final piece of the puzzle. We have a reputable manufacturer that's mentioning the word dissociation as a cause of early tube failure. I've also been further into this site and my thought was that well when my tube goes you know if I've got a four-year warranty on the tube even if they're coming from America I'll pay the shipping costs and we get a good quality tube. So let's take a quick look at the price of a 60 watt tube, $3,400. Well for the same amount of money I could buy 10 Chinese tubes and they would probably last me 8 to 10 years with the inconvenience of having to swap them over occasionally but the point I'm really making here is this is an industrial quality laser tube at industrial prices not domestic prices. I can't justify spending that amount of money on a single tube when, as and when I need it, I can go out and buy a cheap replacement. Well, here's the laser tube we've been talking about. Um, <clears throat> this is my old original laser tube. And after close inspection and measurement, I tracked down what I think is maybe the real reason why this tube was not working properly. I think you can probably see, although this is probably not the best angle, but there's probably about 25% of the surface of this mirror at the top edge here, which is not attached to the heat sink. And you can see how the heat sink glue is actually laying across here at an angle, a wedge. And basically what that means is that part of this mirror is cooled by this water. And you can see that it's not very efficiently cooled because, you know, we've got quite a large thickness here of glass. Um, for the temperature to have to move through. So what I'm going to do is to set this tube up in the machine again. I'm going to re-establish it in the machine. I'm not, not going to worry about setting up the mirrors. Um, I'm just going to do a test, a power test on the output of the tube. Well I fitted my old tube into my machine. I've not bothered to set it up particularly well because I'm not going to be using it for any real purpose other than test the power as it comes directly out the laser. Now I've already run this and done some power tests and this is the strange characteristic that we get. We go from 10 to 95 percent and we go from 1 watt up to about 32 or 33 watts. So at the recommended maximum running current which is 20 milliamps here I get about 31 watts. I actually get more wattage, I get about 32 or 33 watts if I drop the power down to about 45%, which is very strange. But then you can see we've got this very strange characteristic. As I start driving the current up, the power actually drops off quite rapidly. 
and that could well be indicative of the fact that the mirror is heating up and I'm not getting the power out beyond a certain point. I'm generating too much heat for the mirror to, to deal with it. This little tube of heat transfer grease which I'm now going to try and apply to the gap inside there. It's a bit gooey but you're not going to be too concerned if it does the job. When we're using the power probe down at the nozzle um, I don't want the power to stay in one spot so I've written a, a program which is a spiral and that runs for exactly 20.2 seconds which is the amount of time that I have to run the test for for this power meter. And now I can press my start button. No panic, I've got 10 or 15 seconds. Make sure zero is right. And I put this in front of the gap here, in front of the tube, and I move it around. Now the tube colour is a very, very pale pink. It really is virtually white. Now we check the power. We watch the power meter. Just about struggled up to 26. Well, did we achieve anything with this old tube? Let's have a look at what this graph means. Along the bottom, we've got our dialed in percentage power. A rather strange characteristic, as you can see, because at the, what I would class as normal or expected operating range, the intersection of 20 and the red line you'll see that the power of the blue line there is around about 31 or 32 watts but it's on a falling slope and it drops off dramatically so it is very possible that if we follow the blue line up to its maximum which is at about probably 45 percent power we reach a critical point there where the heating in the mirror is such that it starts to bend and go offline and in doing so we're no longer increasing our power very gently but in fact we're dropping the power off rapidly as you can see. Did we achieve anything useful? Well we definitely improved the performance of the mirror by adding the heat transfer compound but to be honest it's still a rubbish characteristic. The only thing that this is good for is an emergency backup tube so it'll go into the top of my garage and sit there in case I need it one day because I know that I can still extract around about 32 watts from it. But having said that um, this, these tubes have got a shelf life and it's very possible by the time I come to use it it will be useless anyway. Well sadly we're running out of time for this session and we shall have to create a part three which will be all about reinstalling my new tube and all the problems that we might encounter when I do that and produce this graph for the new tube.